in the last two or three years, we seem to see an explosion of litigation, especially corporate litigation, where we are now talking sectors at stake. And almost any decision of this government is being challenged in courts. Uh, and I'll come to the bit about judicial activism in just a bit. But I first wanted to understand from you, why do you think that's happening? Sir? No, but you is it because of ad hocism in policy making? Because almost every policy yeah, but that, that is being challenged. True. No, but, but what happened? You're saying decisions are challenged. It's a non-decision. Right. Uh, okay. nobody, yeah, yeah, no, no one wants to take a decision. And because, that's because somebody is looking over his shoulder in order to take a decision. Or maybe taking a decision not convince themselves. And, and perhaps, and perhaps, we are now realizing some of the dangers of other, what was otherwise and is otherwise a very great measure, namely the RTI Act, the Right to Information Act. In the old days, you didn't know what was happening in government. So all this was not exposed. Today it's exposed, which is a good thing. Please don't mis misunderstand. I believe it's a good thing, very good thing. But we have now to devise a method by which we are in a position to build upon this RTI Act that we have given ourselves, namely the Right to Information Act. And how do we marry it or adjust it with two very important provisions of the Evidence Act, which is 123 and 124 of the Evidence Act, which everybody has forgotten today. And that is that affairs of state, what they call the affairs of state, which meant Everything that's done within government is absolutely privileged. Absolutely privileged. Very, very difficult. Now, how do you adjust these two? Affairs of state should not be absolutely privileged. I can see. And they cannot be absolutely privileged, especially after the RTI Act has come in. But we have not, uh, or the great minds of India have not yet, thought of how to adjust these two concepts. The concept which remains in a law which is passed in 1872 and another law which is passed only in the 1990s. But how would you explain, sir, the enormous amount of corporate litigation, economic litigation that has just burst out into the scene? Would you say that the judiciary is stepping in because it sees the executive very weak in decision making or no decision making. Yeah, Do you see it as corporate warfare being played out in courts? How would you read it? Uh, I don't know. It's a bit of both, perhaps. You see, I think it's a lack of policy. If you lay down a firm policy in your budget or wherever it is, we are talking now of financial implications, and you say that this is going to be a state of affairs till the next year, and don't alter it, there would not be half the litigation that we have. It's by constantly altering this state of affairs with a shrewd suspicion that powerful interests are behind it. Shrewd suspicion. You can't prove it. Then people start building up stories. And those stories do acquire a bit of impetus and, and truth, an element of truth. And that's where, what is now happening today. This is very, very unfortunate. Very and, unfortunate. And, do you, do you think and, and, and also the corporate giants going after one another. The sort of stories we hear, which are true or not true, it all very depends. That, uh, you see, each one trying to vie with the other. And uh, perhaps the government then have favorites on one side, they have no favorites on the other. And each, each government, when it comes into power, has its own favorites in the corporate sector. So the corporate sector is also not all that innocent as your question projects. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't saying they're innocent at all, sir. <laughs> so my other concern, uh, which I wanted to share your thoughts on, is that we've seen simultaneously as all of this happened, we've seen courts pronouncing orders on large economic issues, yeah. whether it is scrapping all licenses, yeah. putting an end to mining. Yeah. Uh, and some have said that perhaps the understanding of economic realities is something the judiciary has not really got a grip of and they've just stuck to the law and passed their orders. Do you, are you of that view? What I personally think is that since there has been a great deal of judicial, what you call activism, in playing up in the interests, uh, in the larger interests of public interest, 
it is but right that we should introduce a system which prevails in many European countries. Namely, that judging is not only by law. There are so many other interests that are covered, of which we know very little. Therefore, we should have, in matters that are very important, like telecommunications and the like, experts to assist the judges themselves. And I don't see why we cannot even at the highest level, in the High Court certainly, but in the Supreme Court as well, have a set of assessors or a set of prominent individuals, economists if you like, telecommunication experts if you like, whom the courts could consult and arrive at a proper responsible decision which doesn't militate against the economy, the future economy of our country. Because I don't think, as at present, the judges or the lawyers who appear are fully equipped with all the pros and cons, the difficulties that arise out of each situation. We take a, we, our, our system proceeds on case to case, one case to another case. But how it affects the general economy, uh, is, nobody is in a position to tell the court, and we should have somebody to tell the court. And particularly with two judges in a bench deciding the case. You see, in the Supreme Court, we have now about 30 judges. But a decision of a bench of two is a decision of the Supreme Court of India. It's not the decision of the bench of two judges. Therefore, I've always asked and said, but nobody listens to me, that, that's not true. <laughs> no, they don't, that the benches of two judges are most ill-fitted to decide cases, save and accept, private disputes between A and B. But where something more is at stake, we must have a bench of three or five. Three is a minimum to decide important cases. Because I do remember in the needle industries case, where two judges differed, where I appeared, there was an important question of law years ago, about 30 years ago. Two judges of the Supreme Court deferred, and then the matter was placed before the bench of three judges who were the senior most in the court, with Chief Justice Chandrachur presiding. The moment I got up, the Chief Justice said, you, Mr. Nariman, you should have told the court that this was not a matter for two-judge bench. He was right. And now, whenever I tell anybody that this is not a two-judge bench, <laughs> they say, no, no, <laughs> we can't afford three judges sometimes. Three judges is a, perhaps a luxury. But I don't see why, now that we have 30 judges, that, that should be a luxury. Every bench in the Supreme Court should have three judges. And we've also had some instances where a same matter is being heard by two different benches. Yes, and you have inconsistent decisions. We had a recent decision about uh, a Lokayuk of Gujarat and a Lokayuk of some other state. And the two decisions were absolutely conflicting. Whether the decision of a chief minister and to whether a Lokayuk should be appointed and who that Lokayuk should be, did the chief justice's opinion prevail or the chief minister's opinion prevail? Because under our constitutional system, the chief minister's opinion is normally to prevail in a state. So that two different benches almost simultaneously decided entirely differently. So how do you know what the law is? And that, that's difficult. And, and, and as I told you, a bench of two, when it decides something, it's the Supreme Court that decides it. But I think that the benches of two have to go.